second. It's 8 o'clock, which is the witching hour. That means we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, uh, I'm Randy Olson. I'm uh, Chair of Ophthalmology here, CEO of the Moran Eye Center. And uh, this is our first group of uh, resident candidates coming through. Always exciting time of the year. We'll get a chance to chat more. I'll meet with each of you individually. And so we're excited to show you what's happening here at the Moran Eye Center. And of course, uh, this is the morning that we always have our grand rounds. We have a special guest today. And with that introduction, I turn it over to my good friend, Kathleen Degree, who will introduce our esteemed guest. Yeah. Good morning. Great to see everybody here. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Joyce Liao, who uh, grew up in Taiwan but moved uh, to Texas. And, um, and then she went to Harvard and got a degree in biochemical uh, sciences, then went on and got a PhD in neuroscience, and then did a uh, residency and fellowship at UCSF. And then she's been at, the, uh, at Stanford University and, and is currently the director of neuroophthalmology there. She's also the fellowship director of neuroophthalmology, and she's now also the vice chair of academic affairs. And Joyce has a, a lot of research interests, and we asked her to kind of catch us up to speed on some of the hot topics in uh, neuro-ophthalmology, and she is going to talk about eye and brain diseases. And Joyce, we're really thrilled that you could be here today uh, with us, and thank you so much for taking the time to come here. So, Joyce. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure and honor. Uh, I'm uh, really jealous of the Moran Eye Institute. <laughs> um, so uh, I want to uh, especially welcome uh, the applicants. Uh, hopefully, um, you know, there'll be no occasion where I might pick on you. <laughs> um, so uh, today, uh, there are a lot of topics, but uh, today we're uh, going to focus on uh, optic neuropathy. So I have no financial uh, disclosure. Uh, and uh, there's been some uh, generous grant funding as well as philanthropy uh, that has resulted in this research. Um, I'm probably uh, telling a group that's um, completely sold, but vision is, uh, turns out, uh, the most important of our senses. Uh, this is a table, uh, a figure from uh, a, a recent um, article in JAMA uh, where they looked at, uh, in UK, about 250 adults uh, of a wide range of ages uh, and asked them uh, which of the senses do they uh, value the most, uh, and partly related to sort of their age and the length of time uh, and uh, the amount of time they're willing to live with disability. And vision was number one, hearing is number two, and balance number three. Uh, there are a, a couple people who felt temperature sense was the most important uh, to them, <laughs> all the way on the right. Um, so I want to talk about um, the eye brain network, uh, which is the heart of neuroophthalmology. Uh, so I'm going to illustrate it uh, with some um, uh, slides and videos. Uh, so when we look, uh, this is a picture of Sanford, uh, we, we fixate. Uh, and we basically uh, put the most sensitive part of our eye, which is the fovea, uh, and align it directly with the area of interest. So if I overlay a Humphrey visual field uh, uh, map of the right eye, uh, you'll see that the center of vision uh, is placed right on uh, the memorial church, uh, and then the blind spot uh, is where we don't see. So when you move your eyes, you basically repeatedly capture this visual information uh, using eye movement uh, and that allow you to see the world. So this is a video of one of my favorite paintings. Uh, it's called Las Meninas by Velázquez. Uh, the circles are the fixations. Uh, and the lines are saccades. Uh, the cir circles, the larger they are, the longer um, uh, this person uh, pause in that area. And so you'll probably notice that the princess in the middle uh, tends to get the most attention initially. We tend to look at whatever is right in the center. This is true when you're watching TV or movies. And it's very clever uh, how they design these things, including ads. Uh, and then uh, you can see that the, the path sort of takes you all over the place, looking at visually striking uh, things, and then land at the dog at the right uh, lower corner. Uh, so basically, this is how we see. There's an attention map of our um, uh, visual path. Uh, if there's no hot spot, 
uh, we actually did not see. You know, so uh, how we plan our eye movement in order to see uh, determines what we see, and the purpose in which we um, um, use to look around the world determines what we actually see. Uh, so here's a, uh, just an example of The Incredibles. Uh, this is a bunch of uh, middle schoolers. Uh, so each circle is a, a middle school student. I had no trouble recruiting subjects for this study. <laughs> uh, and, and so you can see that they follow moving objects. And uh, most of the time, the circles are kind of in the middle. Um, and so uh, we've looked at um, this type of um, uh, video uh, uh, to compare controls versus um, patients with eye movement disorder or a visual field defect. And you could get a sense of you know, how the pattern of eye movement could change depending on disease. So uh, foveation, we align our fovea, sort of our visual axis, with whatever is important. And that gives us vision. Uh, the information comes through the pupil, the pupil needs to be open, uh, is captured by the retina, transmitted through the optic nerve to the brain, through the retinal geniculo cortical circuit, and that allows us to process the information. And like I said before, the eyes move in order to repeatedly capture visual information. So this is basically everything you need to know about neuroophthalmology. <laughs> All right, so um, we're going to talk about two stories today. Thanks, Joyce. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, you got to start gentle. Right? <laughs> One slide, this is all you need to know. Um, all right, so the first story is uh, about ischemic optic neuropathy, uh, and I'm going to talk about our uh, animal research uh, inspired by our patients, uh, and then I'm going to talk about optic distrusion research. So it's a little intimidating to come to Moran and talk about optic distrusion, but I'll try my best, and the, the goal actually is hopefully we can set up some wonderful collaborations going forward. So what causes ischemic optic neuropathy? So the short answer is we don't know. If you fall asleep, you could just remember that. But there's some uh, interesting clues based on um, a small number of patients that I've seen. So let me start with a case. This is a 48-year-old man who is healthy, extremely active, and he went hiking at Sierra Nevada. So um, he's done this before, nothing unusual. Uh, three days of vigorous hiking later, um, he developed some vision issues. So at that altitude, which is not too different from some of the altitudes that you experience hey, it's here. it's low by Utah standards. <laughs> <laughs> um, each breath, he is breathing in 26% less oxygen. So I saw him eight days after the onset of vision loss. At that time, his visual acuity was 20-20 in both eyes, and he had normal color vision. Uh, there's an inferior altitudinal visual field defect in the left eye and uh, swelling of the uh, optic nerve head. There's a dis at risk uh, on the other side, which is uh, uh, common in patients with non arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. So we diagnosed him with um, AION associated with high altitude exposure. He had um, progression of his vision loss, and he, he wasn't eligible for any of the clinical trials for AION, and so he actually uh, went on to having counting finger vision uh, and uh, generalized uh, visual field defect, basically across the um, fixation. Uh, and uh, this is actually um, typical of the patients I've seen associated with uh, high altitude, whether it is uh, from you know, actual high altitude, hypobaric hypoxia, or sometimes uh, a plane ride. And, and so in case you don't know, that's actually a, a moderate high altitude, which I'll show you in the next slide. So associated with visual field loss, uh, early on, he had a dropout of the superior uh, peripapillary uh, microvasculature corresponding to the inferior altitudinal field defect. And then uh, chronically, when he has generalized vision loss, there's a generalized loss of vessel density. So um, I have one slide on, on high altitude hypoxia. So um, this is um, sea level, 20.9% uh, oxygen. At Mount Kilimanjaro, uh, which is uh, pretty high, uh, not, not higher than some of the altitudes here. Uh, the, you're breathing 10% um, oxygen. Uh, the amount 
of oxygen in the air is the same, but because of the hypobaria, the available amount of oxygen is reduced. And at Mount Everest, uh, this is only 6.9%. So um, we're, we're near you know, the valley. Uh, it's actually quite a bit higher than Palo Alto, which is nine meters. So around here is already 1,700. So you know, as a visitor, I'm already working hard. <laughs> um, so for commercial aircraft, um, you know, it, it's actually up there, 18, so it's pressurized. Uh, to uh, relative high altitude, and the airline industries have gotten away with this for many years. Uh, there are actually studies done in healthy uh, individuals, athletes, to look at performance and the effect of um, travel. Um, so it, it has a real impact. Um, at um, high, high altitude is considered about 2,500 to 3,500 meters, and at the um, highest peak, of uh, the Wasatch Mountains, you know, it's up there. So this is when, uh, you're probably all acclimated, but uh, so some people uh, may get acute uh, mountain sickness uh, and uh, cerebral pulmonary uh, edema. At very high altitude, uh, it, the symptoms essentially gets worse, and the only treatment is to uh, have oxygen and descend uh, as quickly as possible. So from this patient, um, we hypothesize that perhaps it's the hypoxia that trigger the AION, because he really did not have any other risk factors. Uh, we did screen him for sleep apnea, and there's some very small number of events. His oxygen saturation never really dropped. So we really wonder about the hypoxia, especially with the timing. And this is also the case for the other uh, uh, high altitude associated uh, AION. Uh, so the question is, what's the effect of short-term uh, hypoxia on the retina and optic nerve? Um, I'm going to present uh, work that's done by uh, people in the lab, uh, in particular the first two, uh, Louise and Varun. So we have an uh, animal model of systemic hypoxia. It's basically a hypoxia chamber, uh, and we could dial in you know, and control the amount of oxygen. So we started with something very gentle, equivalent to going and hiking at a higher altitude. So uh, we pick 10%. Uh, uh, oxygen uh, for 48 hours. So if we do the analysis, what we see is uh, that there's no loss of retinal ganglion cells after 48 hours of hypoxia. Uh, this is a retina whole mount preparation stain with a marker for retinal ganglion cells called brain 3 a uh, If we look at the uh, optic nerve and the retina for cell death uh, with an assay called tunnel stain, um, it, not much is happening, you know, after 48 hours. There are a few tunnel positive cells, especially in the outer nuclear layer, uh, but uh, not, not a whole lot. Uh, but what we did find was that uh, the optic nerve oligodendrocytes were the most vulnerable, even with just 48 hours of hypoxia. So there's a significant loss of uh, oligodendrocytes uh, with hypoxia. So um, how could hypoxia lead to AION? when so little is happening. Um, so we wonder about the glia, the role of the glia, because the oligodendrocytes were the only ones that were lost, and uh, we searched the literature. Um, so it turns out the oligodendrocytes are extremely vulnerable to metabolic stress um, because they have to synthesize a lot of proteins and lipid in order to myelinate and support the um, uh, retinal ganglion cell axons. They're also selectively vulnerable to uh, hypoxic ischemic injury because of their glutamate uh, receptor expression. Uh, and then, after a lot of um, lit search, I discover that X-linked Charcot-Marie tooth, type one, where there's a mutation in Connexin 32, is actually one of the uh, rare neurological diseases that's associated with decompensation at high altitude. And guess what it affects? the white matter. So you get MRI lesions. And uh, this protein is only expressed in the central oligodendrocytes. So, you know, really compelling for the fact that if you have high altitude and hypobaric hypoxia, that you could get a uh, decompensation of glial function, which then leads to axonal and neurological uh, disease. Uh, so revision of the hypothesis. Hypoxia leads to metabolic stress, possibly in the glia or other cells, leading to AION. So um, we previously reported 
that um, experimental AION is associated with increased endoplasmic reticulum stress. So uh, this is part of the uh, unfolded protein response, one of the most important and earliest cellular endogenous responses to stress. So it could be intracellular stress, such as oxidative stress, mitochondrial stress. It could be environmental stress, such as hypoxia, ischemia, diabetes, you know, you name it. Uh, this is the common pathway that acts really early on. And what happens uh, when it acts uh, is there's a bunch of adaptive uh, mechanisms that will return the cell to homeostasis where, you know, the cells would survive, or if there's prolonged ER stress, then you could have activation of the pro-apoptotic pathway uh, and leading to inflammation and cell death. And one of the hallmark of that pathway is a transcription factor uh, called CHOP. So uh, we show that in uh, AION, uh, in animal model, that uh, there's prominent expression of, of this molecule. So let me, let me tell you about the, the model a little bit. We basically take the uh, Pascal laser that you use for patient care uh, and uh, uh, shine um, a low energy laser spot uh, via photochemical thrombosis um, and induce a local uh, optic nerve head ischemia. It's a um, very nice model and actually quite easy. Uh, you get whitening uh, consistent with um, loss of perfusion. Uh, we do serial in vivo imaging as well as histology to analyze what happens. So uh, we look in the retina and um, within one day after AION induction, you can see a significant increase in the CHOP expression in the ganglion cell layer. Uh, and uh, this is both retinal ganglion cell body as well as the astrocytes that are in that layer. Um, the uh, quantification showed that there's a significant uh, increase. So um, there's a very early increase in significant cellular stress uh, in the retina after AION. And this is not just isolated to area near the nerve, uh, but it's actually quite diffuse. Uh, if we look at the optic nerve, so this is just a, um, um, a section showing um, uh, oligodendrocytes uh, in the optic nerve, which is labeled with uh, a marker called uh, OLIG2 that labels all oligodendrocytes. Uh, what you can see is that in control, there's no expression of CHOP. And then with, uh, within one day after uh, AION, uh, it's like the Christmas tree lit up. Uh, so lots of CHOP expression uh, that overlap with oligodendrocytes. But there's actually a substantial population that's specifically in astrocytes. Um, so you have to remember there's no neuron in the optic nerve. So all the cell bodies are glia or blood vessels. So the optic nerve is composed of axons <coughs> of the retinal ganglion cell, all the glia elements that's supporting the axons uh, and, and the blood vessels. So this significant increase uh, uh, both in the retina and the optic nerve is quite striking and indicates that there's uh, kind of a diffuse and uh, acute stress uh, in, in AION. So with that in mind, what happens to 48 hours of hypoxia? Did it induce uh, this pathway? So um, what we see is that in the retina, so it's kind of a complicated slide, but in the retina, uh, you see a clear increase in CHOP expression in the retinal ganglion cells after 48 hours of hypoxia. And if you look at the optic nerve, um, it's actually pretty striking how uh, the increase is mainly in the unmyelinated portion of the optic nerve. So you have to remember, at this area, the lack of myelination means action potentials are being passively propagated, there's an incredible energy demand and a lot of mitochondria and uh, mechanisms that are necessary to make this happen. So essentially, the optic nerve lights up like a Christmas tree when there's hypoxia, just 40 hours of Mount Kilimanjaro equivalent. Uh, hypoxia. And if you um, look at different parts of the optic nerve and quantify that, what you see, it's true that there's really no change in the CHOP expression in the myelinated portion, and there's, um, which is in yellow, 
uh, and there's a, a increase only in the unmyelinated. So just to remind everybody, the unmyelinated portion is basically all astrocytes. And, and there's some really unique optic nerve head astrocytes uh, that some people uh, have been characterizing. And then in the myelinated portion is a combination of astrocytes and oligos, which are connected to provide support for the axons. So if we look at um, gliofibrillary acidic protein uh, expression, uh, we see also see an increase in the expression uh, in the retina as well as the optic nerve head, and that's consistent with um, gliosis or astrogliosis, uh, which you know people debated whether reactive gliosis is a positive or negative or both. Uh, but essentially, 40 hours of hypoxia is um, already sufficient to induce all of these changes in the glia. So even though there's no tunnel staining, you know, very little, no cell death in the retina, there's no cell death in the optic nerve, there's a lot of activity happening uh, uh, under the surface inside the cell. So uh, we looked at um, the cytokine profiling uh, because one of the hallmark of increased cell stress and a path to cell death is inflammation. Uh, and this is a, a seven-day hypoxia, same chamber, 10% uh, oxygen. And what we find is that uh, there is a, a, a significant increase in the um, multiple different cytokines, 18 actually, uh, and uh, within uh, one week of hypo hypoxia. And if we were to take the animals out of the hypoxia chamber and let them recover for essentially 12 to 18 hours, uh, the cytokine uh, uh, expression actually already dramatically reduced by that time. So it really suggests a model where you have a lot of activity with hypoxia, whether it's from you know, going to high altitude for a short period of time, obstructive sleep apnea, or other systemic diseases, and then recovery to normoxia, um, you know, so things calm down again. But the cycle of hypoxia and normoxia may be a, a critical factor in triggering AION. So hopefully I'll have more to report in the future, but we're really excited uh, by this study. So uh, inspired by our uh, patients with um, high altitude AION, uh, what we find is that in animal model of uh, hypoxia, there is a uh, significant loss of the optic nerve oligodendrocytes uh, consistent with their metabolic demand and vulnerability for um, metabolic stress. Uh, there's no retinal ganglion cell loss um, with short-term hypoxia, but there's a lot of increase in the um, activity around there, including uh, this expression of CHOP, a pro-apoptotic um, cell death transcription factor. Finally, with a cytokine profiling, uh, we see that there is uh, in cytokines and inflammation already activated as, a post of, as part of post-hypoxic uh, inflammation. And this could be an important target for treatment. Uh, so you know, uh, we're happy to identify some uh, potentially uh, novel uh, therapies. Uh, and we've already started um, some uh, testing uh, that I'm not going to uh, go into today because the human data is so sparse. But in animal model, we've shown that there's a significant rescue of um, both retinal ganglion cells and oligodendrocytes if you were to lower endoplasmic reticulum stress. And we've only done that in all of one patient. Uh, because uh, it's very expensive. It's something like, it's an FDA approved drug for urea cycle treatment and it's something like $180,000 a month. <laughs> the company is calling me to find out more information. So um, the new model of AION is um, uh, such that hypoxia, which um, you know, essentially is a result of vascular risk factors, sleep apnea, uh, et cetera, that leads to a failure of glia, oligodendrocytes and astrocytes, which work together and triggers inflammation. And this leads to failure of retinal ganglion cell axons, which leads to uh, ischemic optic neuropathy. So let me illustrate it a little bit. There's the orange, which is the uh, a single retinal ganglion cell axon, which is in sheath by oligodendrocytes, uh, and the astrocytes, which is in green, uh, are connected through um, uh, direct communication. So you have uh, lactate, which is one of the main energy source. Um, the, the oligodendrocytes provide a lot of the energy support for the axons. Uh, 
goes from the um, oligodendrocytes uh, directly through channels into the retinal ganglion cell axons, which gives you ATP. So if you fail in the glia, you will fail in the axon, and that leads to AION. So it's possible you have sort of these repetitive um, uh, episodes of hypoxia led on by hypoperfusion, which is historically very well um, um, described uh, as the, the cause of AION. And this is highly relevant to glaucoma, because as you know, ischemia is a, a significant component of glaucoma, and this may be one mechanism by which uh, glaucoma also um, uh, occurs. In case you don't know, Stanford is kind of the land of the glia, uh, and so it, it's an area that I'm hoping we'll be able to investigate much, much more. So um, just to summarize this part of the talk, the eyes bring the world to our brain. The brain gives us vision, and the vision gives us human experience. So the key for um, us you know, doing uh, translational uh, research is to be cognizant of the long distance pathway between the eye and the brain with the optic nerve as the connector to deliver this information. And so disease in the eye, as well as disease in the brain could affect that eye-brain network. Uh, and so the goal of you know, our research is really to use all the amazing tools that we have now to be, uh, be able to diagnose patients early, uh, both for AION as well as for glaucoma uh, and other diseases so that we could intervene, uh, so that we could develop uh, novel treatments. So maybe I'm gonna pause a little bit for questions before I go on to the next part. <clears throat> Fascinating. Uh, having spent a lot of time between 3,000 and 4,000 meters in my life, uh, another profound thing that happens is not just that uh, uh, your partial oxygen pressure drops quite dramatically, but your body wants to make up for it. And so in order to do that, there, there can be pretty profound respiratory alkalosis. And, yes. and that's typically what causes a, a, a continuum of symptoms from almost everyone, if they, particularly if they go from sea level to 3,000 meters, for instance, are gonna get a headache. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of people get altitude sickness, which is really a, a kind of a, a mild form of cerebral edema onto the full edema. And I, I remember uh, I brought Klaus Dolman out here in my early career. So he went from Boston to a meeting we had at Snowbird, and that night he got both pulmonary and cerebral edema. <laughs> so it, it's, it's, it's really hard. and so. Have you looked to see how much a pH balance maybe also is impacting some of these things? Uh, so the question is about um, uh, uh, respiratory alkalosis, alteration in pH in high altitude, uh, and uh, whether we've looked uh, in this model. So we have not looked, um, but certainly pH is um, a, a big part of it. Uh, there's actually also some literature that pH uh, uh, recovery for the um, body is actually relatively fast once you go into... Oh, you, you can know. feel it. I, you, literally, you can feel it. Yeah. And, and I would say, typically, you know, it's about 48 hours. Uh, it's, it's 24 to 48 hours, and you can all of a sudden feel that, you know, your, your, that headache is going away, and you're, you're getting a little more energy. So you're right. That that's, does not take very long. But, but it certainly is profound, and, and, and I think the acute changes like pulmonary edema and cerebral edema are probably a lot of it's related to that pH change. Um, we should work on that. And the pH in the central nervous system, there's some data suggesting that uh, there's a relative delay in that pH recovery in the, in the central nervous system. Right. Uh, so uh, I didn't show this data, but we actually looked at uh, the retina using OCT, uh, hypoxia, uh, and then with uh, recovery. And what we see is within one day, of normoxia, there is a dramatic swelling of the retina. Wow. Uh, and, and so it's actually quite striking uh, that uh, such a short, you know, sort of a hypoxia normoxia recovery could lead to such a prominent edema. And we've looked at um, different molecules, including uh, aquaporin-4 uh, and, 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 and a variety of molecules that seem postulated to you know, be important for edema. But basically, uh, if what we see in the retina is what's happening in the brain, uh, it, it's quite dramatic. And, and just the other one, and, and Kathleen and our other group, I mean, it seemed to be epidemiologically, to support your hypothesis, mm 
that by looking at a group of people who regularly are backpacking and spending time about 3,000 meters, of which we have a whole bunch of people, yes. and compare what the overall incidence of NAON is with that group versus people who typically are living at sea level, and is there a difference in incidence would, would support the you know, hypothesis. Do, do we have that kind of data? That we don't. Nope. Well, yeah. wouldn't, wouldn't it be the people at sea level, though, that would have these events, right? Because, because we become like acclimatized to the mm -hmm. altitude. So when mm -hmm. we go up higher, we'd be less likely to see it versus someone coming from sea level experiencing Well, if I understand what you're saying in association with this, not, not necessarily. Well, at any rate, if, you, if we were to com we could compare that or a group of people who regularly go from sea level and go and come climb in our mountains. There's certainly a lot of those, too, who fly here all the time. They regularly are spending trips at higher level. That would be, where's Brian Stagg? We got yeah, Brian here. Can raise my hand? So the, the Utah population database, we have, we have kind of a cool, yeah, have you heard about it? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. This is partly why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> hey! Yeah. So they do code, like, the, the altitude where the person lives. Do you think that would be helpful, like the variation in altitude here? Like someone who lives at a lower altitude in Utah versus someone who lives at a higher altitude in Utah. Do you think there'd be a difference in risk as far as risk of development of having an AI on? Um, so those studies would be helpful for sure. Uh, it will take thousands of uh, well, we, we, The Utah patients. population database is now somewhere yeah. like 30 million different people in it now. Yeah, because you want to look at, um, you know, who, who got uh, AIO. So it, it's a difficult study, actually. Uh, a a uh, easier study would be to, to do what you propose, which is look at before and after. And we have a grant to look at cytokine profiling, but we've also looked at some of the other components of blood. Um, that's the you know, most easily accessible fluid to us. Uh, and so uh, there are clear uh, uh, biological activity within the plasma uh, so that, for example, if we were to apply human AION uh, plasma uh, isolated, uh, uh, either plasma alone or extracellular vesicles carrying components, uh, it induces vascular formation. Uh, and, and, you know, basically wow. the beginning of, uh, you know, vascular you're genesis. you're something here. I, we, yeah. we ought to need so, so that, that'd be a study. Uh, that would be interesting to study. Yes. Yeah, just to amplify on that a little bit. Um, yes, it's the blow off of the CO2 with the hypoxia that is actually, the optic nerve is much more uh, susceptible to this mm -hmm. than the rectal. <coughs> But what's also, I think, implicated in this, even small amounts of sleep apnea, at the end of each hypoxic apneic episode, there is a reprise that consists of much more, high, much more uh, breathing, but also a, a huge uh, peak in your blood pressure. So this can aggravate mm -hmm. that injury. Mm -hmm. And then a question, have you ever tried erythropoietin? Intraocular erythropoietin for non autoritic ischemic optic neuropathy. It can, it's, it's demonstrated to protect not only neuronal protection but oligodendrocytic protection. Think about it. Yeah, uh, so um, I haven't done it personally. Uh, there's um, clear animal data supporting you know, it being uh, neuroprotective for retinal ganglion cells. Um, uh, I, I believe the drug is actually in clinical trial. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. It's not not for um, ischemic optic neuropathy, but you know, you know for for glaucoma uh, potentially. Uh, and, and it has to be the form that doesn't induce, you know, doesn't have the hematologic uh, effect, of course. Or so, uh, There was a there was a, whole, a small human study of erythropoietin as well. Um, and uh, as with most studies with AION, it was meh. But you know you need you need hundreds and hundreds of patients for AI to prove any kind of either benefit or non-benefit. The other confounding factor for the <laughs> travelers here is that that you'd really have to um, control for other vascular risks. Mm -hmm. There might be one could hazard that those who have a propensity for doing crazy things at high altitude might be overall more fit than those who choose to kind of hang out in the valley. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, it would be interesting to look at the effect of exercise in those. But yes, it's a difficult study with the, that requires a lot. So I think it's almost better if you were to identify specific um, theory, you know, what, what might be working in animal models, and then go and really look at the human data.
Um, I, I think Kathleen, you had a question. Well, oh, so go ahead. Uh, Based on the on your data, do you, from a practical point, do you count the patients that have had AION not due to those extreme activities at high altitude, or get on a plane in the near future? So, um, in the short term, I ground all of them. Uh, <laughs> And uh, in the long term, um, I don't have the data to tell them not to do it. And so I just ask that they bring their portable CPAP machine just in case. Um, so uh, the, that patient that I presented actually has uh, chosen to continue his lifestyle. Uh, and in fact, one day his dream was to hide the John Muir Trail, which, uh, anyway, uh, he's been okay so far without the second eye involved. And so hopefully we'll have treatment before anything happens to him. Yes. Do you think, in, have you used in your model just uh, um, the oxygen with these animals that get these kind of the edema to see whether that would rescue any part of it or keep them from getting worse? Uh, good question. So whether oxygen treatment is helpful. So the, the only thing we've done so far is just returning them to normoxia okay, for a short too. period of time, uh, but not for you know, longer. Uh, it's remarkable how the cytokine normalize within that short amount of time, even after a week in hypoxia. So, so we would predict that there's enough sort of endogenous mechanisms that you're not going to lose a lot of cells. But definitely the outer nuclear layer is actually where you have the most tunnel positive cells uh, in, in the two-day and certainly increase in the, in the seven-day uh, model. Any studies on hyperbaric oxygen uh, treatment? Yeah, so highly controversial uh, <laughs> uh, and, and, and no good data. Uh, I would say that uh, in the right patients, I have encouraged them to do it. Uh, basically, the idea of uh, bypassing the blood vessels and directly delivering oxygen um, is, is appealing. So it's not covered by insurance, and patients have to pay out of pocket. Uh, I usually tell them, because uh, usually there's not enough time to figure out that if they have sleep apnea or not, so I would tell them to do the, you know, the typical 1.2, well, 2.4 um, uh, hemispheric um, pressure treatment as late in the day as possible. Uh, so that will maintain their oxygen tension for as many hours as possible while they may be more vulnerable. Uh, so um, I have not been impressed by hyperbaric oxygen alone. But uh, in, in this one patient where we did uh, this drug, expensive drug for uh, reducing ER stress, uh, I wonder whether the combination with hyperbaric oxygen may have played a role. We, we did see a, a, a remarkably, uh, like relatively um, uh, improved uh, and less severe for, for someone with a high altitude uh, ischemic optic neuropathy. Yes. But you saw progressive vision loss in, in at least that one particular patient. So I wondered if you thought there were reactive oxygen species or if it was what, what might also be contributing to that mm -hmm. vision loss. So the question is, um, the, the, the patient I show has progressive severe vision loss, but the changes in hypoxia were relatively um, uh, transient, meaning reversible. So that patient did have AION, and, and so that's a different, um, you know, than, than just having hypoxia alone. Um, so the idea is how do we figure out, uh, how do we prevent the AION from occurring uh, in, in hypoxia? Uh, I, and I think uh, your point about the pH uh, is likely a role, that there is some selective vulnerability in the CNS, in the optic nerve, uh, white matter specifically, uh, that it is uh, contributing uh, to the uh, you know, uh, persistent uh, hypoxic-induced uh, changes that then one day you know, goes over uh, and, and develops full-blown AION. Okay, it's amazing uh, questions. Um, all right, so um, we're gonna talk about optic distrusion, so be gentle with me. <laughs> so um, optic distrusion is a uh, acellular deposit uh, uh, located on the optic nerve head uh, in the unmyelinated portion 
uh, anterior to the lamina cribrosa uh, is different from the drusen in macular degeneration. So this is what a um, photo might look like, sort of a lumpy, bumpy appearance of the optic nerve head with a lot of texture and the arrows pointing to a, a large druse. Uh, with autofluorescence imaging, you could see uh, these uh, drusens uh, that are superficial. Uh, and with ultrasound, you could uh, detect that there is uh, the presence of something that shouldn't be there. So uh, in optic distrusion, there's uh, obvious compartment syndrome. There's crowding of the optic nerve uh, and, and uh, abnormal blood vessel. Uh, and so you could have a relative uh, degree of uh, prominence of the superficial drusens. We just you know, call it uh, mild, moderate, and severe. Severe meaning you know, full of uh, um, drusen uh, on uh, autofluorescence imaging, for example, uh, or on color uh, from this uh, photo. Uh, some patients uh, develop uh, vision loss, and we don't know why. Uh, anywhere from 25 to 75 percent of patients develop vision loss. What changes in that group versus in the group that just has some drusens but never develop any issues? Um, so uh, the, the idea was to uh, look at um, uh, this particular um, uh, connection, you know, what causes the, uh, th enough damage in the optic nerve that uh, the patients will develop uh, vision loss. Uh, sort of a different problem from AION. Uh, and, and, and Drusen's, uh, of course, is a significant risk factor for um, developing uh, ischemic optic neuropathy. So here are just uh, an example of a nine-year-old uh, on the left uh, with Drusen and this sort of really tall, uh, mountain-like appearance at the optic nerve head. Uh, and then on the lower part is both eyes of a 19-year-old uh, with optic disc Drusen. And uh, so these are really easy to image, uh, and uh, the Utah group has certainly been looking at uh, using OCT with enhanced depth imaging uh, to uh, look at these uh, optic nerve head drusens. So um, essentially, uh, after Mueller described it many decades ago, uh, in, in fact, like 150 years, <laughs> we still don't know uh, what causes the drusens. <laughs> it was uh, described histologically and then ophthalmoscopy uh, uh, after it was invented, you know, you could start to see these drusens. So um, it's thought to involve calcification of the mitochondria that's extruded from intraoptic nerve uh, axons, uh, which then forms these sort of a nucleus for uh, a, a, um, a process that gives rise to larger and larger drusens. Uh, it's thought to be related to uh, some kind of axonal defect. Uh, possibly in the metabolism uh, or the axon transport of the um, uh, axons. So, you know, this, the, the clinical description, uh, you know, the phenotype is really clear, but the biology is completely unclear. So uh, our question is, in patients with optic drusen, we, we ask the simple questions because we're kind of new to this field. Uh, so can we use OCT and OCTA to image uh, and uh, whether these measurements uh, correlate with uh, vision loss? Uh, and is OCTA um, valuable in addition to OCT? So um, OCT and geography is uh, uh, become, uh, became relatively uh, uh, you know, more uh, widely used uh, with the um, uh, uh, spectral domain OCT uh, since uh, about 2017. And for optic nerve head, um, you could basically see this area is loaded with blood vessels, uh, and we could use this to quantify. So we did a study of uh, 53 uh, control eyes versus uh, 29 optic disc drusen eyes and, and compare their uh, uh, various measurements. So the data, uh, there's 27 measurements, uh, visual measurement, OCT measurement, and OCT angiography of the macula as well as the peripapillary. Uh, area. The image analysis is done with a custom uh, MATLAB algorithm uh, and uh, also um, uh, some uh, nice uh, um, consultation with our biostatisticians. So um, this is uh, Ricky Wong's uh, algorithm that the data I'm going to show you is built upon. Essentially, we can measure six different measurements per each uh, three by three uh, superficial plexus image, um, both for the uh, macula and, and, and the uh, optic disc. So uh, let me show you an example. Uh, so control is uh, on the left, so that's number one. And then there are four eyes, uh, all left eye of uh, patients with optic disc drusen from someone with no visual field defect to uh, very little, 
um, to more and more. So um, the, the second row is uh, basically the oliferous imaging. You can see uh, more uh, drusens as uh, the severity increases in the superficial area. Uh, and, and then you can see the OCT and geography raw images on the bottom. So we did some uh, further analysis. And basically, uh, the, the analysis is, I think, the, a, a necessary uh, portion to remove the large blood vessels, because they're not so relevant, and they dominate that optic disc uh, picture. So we remove the large blood vessels, and then we could calculate uh, the six different measurements I mentioned. Uh, so this is just a, a heat map of the vessel area density, which is the most commonly measured, uh, uh, commercially available uh, uh, number uh, for um, OCT and geography currently. Uh, and then the bottom one is the vessel complexity index, which is uh, related to the tortuosity of the blood vessels. So basically what you could see is that in uh, the drusen with severe vision loss on the right, that there is a dropout. So you know a reduced uh, heat map, reduced vessel area density. Uh, and uh, there's also a reduction in the vessel complexity uh, index. Uh, just for comparison, uh, these are uh, eyes from uh, diabetic retinopathy as well as anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. So um, those of you who are uh, really interested in diabetes, I would encourage you to consider studying the optic nerve uh, because uh, a lot probably happens there that, that we're unable to measure until now. So in diabetic retinopathy, which is the second row, uh, in patient, so this is a, a patient with A1C greater than eight and um, you know, 10 years of diabetes, uh, there's actually a, a fullness and an increased vessel and an increased tortuosity of the uh, superficial vessels on the uh, optic uh, disc. And in, in acute AION, there's some dropout uh, superiorly. Uh, and the same eye uh, chronically, you can see that there's a, a significant loss of the vessel area density. So uh, just looking at these easy measurements that you could obtain clinically uh, could tell us a lot about the blood vessel state. And you have to keep in mind that OCT and geography is kind of a functional measurement. It's not perfect, but there's a flow component. And as we go from um, the current um, uh, 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 sub source, uh, sorry, from the current spectra, spectra domain OCT to like a 200 kilohertz uh, uh, sub source OCT, we're gonna get better and better at being able to look at flow and look at these uh, measurements. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna summarize our, our uh, findings uh, in, in a, uh, a few slides. So uh, the take home message is that in optic dystrusion and in other optic neuropathies, um, even though we measure six different OCT and geography measurements, many of them are highly correlated. So actually, uh, if you just look at the optic disc vessel area density, that's actually pretty good. So you know, all, the line, all the lines are right in the middle, those are extremely highly correlated. And same thing for the macula. And so the commercial software actually does a decent job. Uh, if we were to look at uh, a, a correlation matrix, just comparing uh, the um, uh, different uh, values, uh, what we see is that visual field loss in optic dystrusion is positively correlated uh, with changes in the OCT, so uh, nerve fiber layer loss, uh, ganglion cell complex, and the optic disc vessel area density. Uh, so that's the red. So in, every, uh, in the first row, that's probably the easiest place to look. Everything that's kind of um, reddish orange uh, is positively correlated. And then uh, it's uh, interestingly negatively correlated with um, macular measurements. So the macular vessel diameter increases in optic dystrusion, and the flux, which is a measurement of flow, increases with optic dystrusion. So very, very striking. Uh, so if you look at principal component analysis, looking at just these five measurements, you could see that you could segregate the controls, which are in the black circles, away from the patients with optic dystrusion really well. Uh, and, and so let me show it to you in a different way. Uh, this is a hierarchical cluster analysis where we uh, basically objectively cluster uh, measurements. So that's the horizontal dendrogram, uh, and we simplified it so it's only these five key measurements versus um, 
the patient measurement. So the vertical dendrogram in the y-axis is every single eye that's included in the database. So it's kind of a complicated um, uh, data set, but the beauty is you can see all the data, uh, and so the reviewers can't complain that you're hiding something, right? So um, the, the take-home story is actually really interesting, which is uh, there are three clusters. So the middle cluster are the uh, controls in optic distrusion with no vision loss. Uh, and so they have normal OCT measurements, nerve fiber layer, ganglion cell complex, uh, normal optic disc vessel area density, and relatively lower um, macular vessel diameter and flux. So group two, that's on the bottom. So these are the patients that have uh, some vision loss, but relatively mild. And what's really striking is that the, um, let's see if I could point, yeah, right here. So these two columns, those are the macular measurements. They turn red. So it seems that mild vision loss, the first thing that's associated with is a change in the macular vas uh, microvasculature. So they still have relatively uh, normal nerve fiber layer and ganglion cell measurements, but the macular measurements has changed. Uh, and then the third group uh, are the patients with more severe vision loss. So in this group, what you see is that the, the, the macular measurements are still increased, but the uh, <coughs> nerve fiber layer, the ganglion cell complex, and the disc vessel area density has decreased. So this seems to be sort of the irreversible component of vision loss in optic distrusion. So um, let me just summarize this in a, in a slightly different way. So uh, basically, the questions that I posed before, which OCT and OCTA measurements are uh, most important for vision loss in optic distrusion? So these are the five. So there are two OCT measurements, nerve fiber layer and ganglion cell complex. Um, they actually do a decent job, uh, but the optic disc vessel area density, the decrease specifically, is important for visual, visual field loss. And the macular vessel diameter and flux increases. Uh, and so that's actually the most uh, striking and, and kind of, I guess I was surprised at the time, but maybe I shouldn't have been, you know. Uh, so uh, these, these five measurements. So it'd be interesting to look at that in other diseases, um, you know, uh, papilledema, um, maybe glaucoma, right? What's the uh, history of progression of these changes? Uh, certainly for, a for AION and Drusen. So does OCT add value beyond, o uh, OCTA add value beyond OCT? Yes. Um, and then um, we think, uh, and this is just a hypothesis because we have no data, no long-term perspective data. We'd love to know if you guys have some data. Uh, so that myovision loss in optic distrusion uh, is associated with the very first thing, which is probably related to autoregulation, just an increase in the blood flow overall, almost as a compensatory measurement um, uh, uh, response to a uh, you know decrease in perfusion at the optic disc. So that's actually the macular vessel diameter uh, and and flux. Uh, and then with visual field loss, you get uh, irreversible thinning of the nerve fiber layer, ganglion cell complex, and, and loss of density. So there may be a combination of um, changes in OCT that uh, potentially precede the um, vision loss, as well as um, changes in OCTA that's as a result of the neurodegeneration. Uh, in, in optic distrusion. So um, I'm happy to report that we were able to, uh, through uh, philanthropy, um, raise money and that's necessary for the research. So uh, we were just approved by Stanford to form their very first uh, Center for Optic Distrusion Research. Um, there's a, a, a basic science uh, group of faculty as well as a clinical uh, group of faculty. Uh, some of them are uh, um, imaged here. Uh, and so um, the idea is that uh, we have a, a pretty ambitious, um, you know, multi-prong approach uh, looking at uh, animal studies as well as human studies. And part of the reason I'm here is this. So I would love to work together to identify the first genes for optic distrusion, which may be also important for uh, other optic neuropathies uh, and retinal diseases. So the goals for the center is to identify uh, important clinical as well as other biomarkers uh, for vision loss. Uh, we want to look at you know, 
uh, at least 100 patients to start with, but um, hopefully we could um, uh, go well past uh, that goal. Uh, we want to know what, what leads to uh, vision loss, uh, both in children and adults. Um, identifying the first genes will go a long way with that, which will tell us you know, who may be vulnerable, uh, who, um, uh, which uh, molecules may be uh, the, the, you know, the, the genes to target uh, either through um, uh, viral deliver um, um, you know, uh, uh, constructs to knock down the expression, boost the expression, uh, or by other ways. Uh, we also have um, uh, the goal to establish the first small and large animal model for optic dystrusin uh, in, in mini pigs. Uh, that's the rodent and mini pigs. Uh, it, that way we could test um, uh, potential therapies. There, there's currently no, no model for optic dystrusin. And then to understand what happens when you have optic dystrusin and lots of it, uh, what happens to the eye brain network. Uh, so uh, I'm going to uh, stop there. Uh, Please uh, consider flying just less than an hour and a half away <laughs> to come to our meeting uh, on, on May uh, 11th. I've gotten some commitments from the neuro-ophthalmology group already, but really would love to see um, you know, all of you uh, at this meeting. Thank you. Thank you.